I, I hear the weather is is positive in Buffalo. It is. <laughs> it is above zero. It is my job to inform people that I rode a bike yesterday and today in Buffalo, New York. And do you have do you have like uh, spikes on the bike tires? No, I I did. Cool. Well, let's get started. Hey, everyone. I'm your host, Kyle, uh, with iFixit, and you're on Repair Radio. We've got Nathan Proctor from US Perg here with us, and Kevin Purdy from the wild and woolly uh, land of Buffalo. Uh, how many How many buffaloes are there in the town of Buffalo? Kevin, are you there? We lost Kevin. Uh, well, I'll, I'll keep, uh, we'll get going while we, while we wait for Kevin to fix his audio. Um, so <laughs> Nathan, Nathan, how are things, how are things in your neck of the woods? Uh, in Boston, it's lovely. We, sun is shining. It's probably in the fifties, which is, you know, good for this time of year, I suppose. I, I have been riding my bike, so that's feeling feeling that uh, spring has sprung here so uh, we have i've got uh, about 10 ducks and uh we have been doing our best to steal all of their eggs and then you know eat them <laughs> and we went out yesterday and we had seven baby ducks so nature found a way and has <laughs> so now i'm the proud proud papa of of baby muscovy ducks and the babies are much cuter than the adult ducks uh, so I think I think spring is 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 fully in force. So let's let's dive in and talk about some of our experience. Nathan and I have been traveling all around the country the last few weeks, and there has been a lot going on in the right to repair world. Um, starting up with uh, with what's going on in Minnesota this week. What's the situation on the ground? Yeah. So I mean, we are in negotiations for the kind of final stretch before we see a floor vote in Minnesota. Um, this is the time in a lot of these, you know, right to repair legislative battles where you get close to a decision point and then you get like a big surge of kind of stuff you need to deal with, like a crazy opposition tactics to slow us down and give and stop us. But so I don't want to necessarily tell everybody all the secret things we have going on behind the scenes in Minnesota, but, um, you know, we are in the kind of, we are pushing to kind of go that last mile and figure out what, what are those last things that we need to do. Um, but if anybody, if you know anybody, or if you're from Minnesota, absolutely go to minnesota.repair.org right now, give your legislator a phone call. Um, we know that they're hearing a lot from our opposition and it's just critical that they also hear from, you know, the people, their constituents and, and the people that they are elected to represent. Yeah. So this is like, we're on the five yard line. We have the possibility to get a floor vote this week. Uh, right. This will be the first time that a right to repair bill has ever gotten a floor vote. Um, but uh, the, the, as we get closer, you know, the opposition is intensified and it is exactly you know, all hands on deck. Um, so right. you know, fo phone calls, particularly in the Minnesota house right now, go a long way. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and, and so uh, we have a, uh, you know, courageous group of folks, Amanda Lagrange uh, from Tech Dump, who's been on the show before, Jen Larson from um, a local IT company. And I mean, just just a great network of folks, everybody from Environment uh, Minnesota uh, and a coalition of repair shops. So they're all they're all working hard on the ground, but their their efforts are amplified by um, by, you know, kind of how much how much uh, sort of activity the legislators are hearing from their constituents, which is all of you. So if, if, if you uh, even have family in, in Minnesota, give them a call, tell them to, tell them to write their legislator. Next up uh, is, is Oregon. I was in, I was in Salem, Oregon a couple weeks ago for the, uh, the right to repair hearing. Oregon, this is an informational only hearing. So it was just, you know, Hey, uh, feeling things out, getting ready for, for the bill next year. Uh, that, uh, that went very well. We had uh, folks from Free Geek, who I'd really like to have Free Geek on the show sometime. Uh, have, have either of you guys ever been to a Free Geek? 
I heard about them. So Free Geek is this amazing open source concept where it, they, they're kind of like an electronics recycler merged with a goodwill, uh, but they have open source ethos. So they get computers donated from all over the place, uh, and they, um, th you know, they're, they're building PCs from all the parts that they can, they can collect all over the place, and then they. Uh, have volunteers come in and they teach you how to build a PC. And if you volunteer for 20 hours, you get to take a PC home with you. Uh, and they have a thrift store where you can go in and buy computers for crazy deals. It's a, it's a really phenomenal place. Um, so Free Geek uh, has, has been hugely in favor of right to repair because one, one threat to their model is that they, uh, they are currently you know, harvesting PCs and PCs are fairly modular, but as they get into things like tablets, you, know, you can't take a, uh, you can't get enough screens off of tablets to make all your tablets with busted screens work. So they need sources for parts and um, you know, they, they've been reliant on iFixit, but we don't, we're not as, uh, as widely, uh, we don't have, iFixit is not comprehensive enough for the volume of products that Freaky gets out. Um, so I, I, it was really cool to get to both go to Salem and testify along with Free Geek, but also go and wander around uh, their facility. And I've always, I always find cool things. I, I, I bought a bunch of MacBook power adapters from them because we, need, we needed more in the office. So they're a really neat organization. And uh, Oregon is, is really just, just picking up speed, I think. I think the, uh, so the, the political environment is, is ripe there for getting something done. Uh, and Oregon is interesting because in auto right to repair, gosh, back in, uh, I want to say something like 2007, maybe maybe uh, later than that, the auto right to repair folks tried in Oregon and failed. Uh, so maybe we'll accomplish something that, that they weren't able to. I just believe you that Oregon's interesting generally. I think so. I mean, Oregon has led the way on a lot of these these policies, and certainly they're, Oregon is really interesting because on the one hand, they're they're a progressive state. On the other hand, you have a lot of conservatives. I mean, Eastern Oregon is, is and Central Oregon is is the majority of the state geographically, and you have a lot of farmers. You have a lot of people that are really reliant on accessing equipment. Uh, Apple does not have an Apple store east of the Cascades, and so it's uh, you're reliant on uh, you know the independent repair community. And and I, I worked. I, I grew up in Oregon. And I worked at a uh, Mac repair center in. Uh, and bend and Apple, even though they, they, we were authorized, Apple ran them out of business. They just, I remember we were selling IMAX for $12.99 and they, uh, the profit for the store was $15 on a $1,300 computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very, very hard to make money on, on those kind of margins. Wow. So that, that's what we'll, what I think is happening is they, uh, yeah, we've seen uh, with some of the documents that Motherboard has released, Apple is, you know, opening up they're saying hey we'll let more people in the authorized tent and that works great while there's political pressure uh, for right to repair they're going to open that up but then what will happen is they're going to they're going to increasingly uh you know crack down on it. they'll say hey can we can we squeeze the margins can we reduce how much we're reimbursing people for warranty repairs can we make things more difficult and it, it's kind of similar to me i, I feel like with, with a union where if you're in an authorized context you don't have a union to fight back at you the manufacturer can just dictate everything doesn't it feel though that like um, customers outside their kind of met major metro areas are like the next growth frontier for them? For for Apple's authorized centers? Yes, like I, it, it seems like on its surface that uh, being able to allow people to own Apple products outside of uh, areas where they're easily accessible to a Mac store or Apple store, um, that just seems like business sense. Like like you said, everything east of the Cascades, right? I, I mean, it seems like that's where that they want to go as they're expanding their authorized network. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing this with all of the cell phone companies have realized you know, 10 years into the smartphone revolution that uh, they still don't have a local service option for their customers. I mean, where do you go to get an HTC phone fixed? Uh, the independents can't get the parts and HTC doesn't have a, a nationwide authorized network. So you mail it into Texas. Um, that's not a great option. No. And you have to do something about your phone in the meantime. You have to carry on a burner or something like that. Right. So Nathan and I were both just in Sacramento. Nathan, give us the lowdown on what, what went down in California. Well, uh, I mean, one of the, it's one of those things where, so the legislators, we had been, we'd done a number of attempts to kind of talk to people about right to repair. So we'd and had a lot of day. Bill, the California bill is different than the bill that we've we've run elsewhere, right? We talked right. about it's, this it, show in the past. It's it, we kind of scaled it back to you know maybe make it somewhat more appealing. And so 
the bill in California only it kind of made some changes to the warranty law so that if you wanted to have a warrantied product, you would need to make parts and service information available. We didn't ask for um, diagnostic software or, or kind of uh, firmware patches like we do in other legislation. We thought this this will be easier. Um, you know, it, there's still a bunch of stuff that we would you need to actually do all the fixes that we need to, you know, kind of maintain the electronics in our lives. But we thought, you know, this is a good it, because California has this very strong warranty law and we can make these changes to it. That would be a good way to get started. And, um, you know, so in probably about a month before we were scheduled to have a hearing uh, on the 28th or was it the 29th? I don't even remember. One of those two days. Um, you know, we'd had a lobby day. We brought up, you know, our kind of scrappy band of tinkerers and makers and STEM educators and repair shop owners. And it was it was it was very difficult to get the attention of the legislators like they it, this bill was too far off for them. They didn't want to talk about it. They were pretty uninformed about the changes that we made to the bill, how much we have simplified the bill. Yeah, they um, the all opposition to think that was, it was the bill from last year. Yeah, they. they the opposition sent a letter saying, you know, talking about all the cybersecurity risks associated with their diagnostic software, but the bill didn't even require them to provide diagnostic software. So they they, they just send in a form letter and the committee it's staff. It's the same form letter that they send to every other state that they send the last yeah. year, which is our, our normal kind of sort of cavalcade of, of opponents. You've got CompTIA and TechNet right. and all these organizations that are that are. Uh, you know, fighting against users that really are just proxies for Apple. The, there's a lot of logos, but really the, the logo behind the scenes is, is Apple. Yeah, it's like, it's we call it the NASCAR letter because um, <laughs> like you know it's got all the logos on it, and they're again they're all these trade associations which are just ways to represent the manufacturer's interests. And then you know, so we've the bill is about to come up for a hearing, and then in California, uh, bills basically. In those hearings, they get voted on, and so you know they're not just they're not just learning about the bill. They like need to make a decision about the bill, and so going up to that hearing, we felt like it was again difficult for us to get in. And finally, the legislators started paying attention to the bill. But by that time, you know that's kind of when you know the Verge and Motherboard reported that Apple sent in their lobbyist along with CompTIA to open up iPhones and show legislators all the horrible and terrible things that could happen if, you know, somebody, if you tried to fix a phone. Um, and so this and is crazy. They're, they're taking a phone and they're saying, if you, if you open it wrong, this is what will happen. Right, right. Like, I, uh, I you know, you could punch with a lithium ion battery, which would, you know, you, which would cause a small, you know, a small thermal event. Um, but of course, you know, I just I just looked at the iFixit iPhone six battery guide because um, I have an iPhone six, and two million people have used that guide. So it's like obvious if it was really dangerous to switch batteries in phones, like somebody in that mix of two million people would have found some kind of you know problem with it. But it's fascinating to me the power of spin because we do this all the time. We take apart the phone. We say, look, it's simple. There's the battery. It's really straightforward and easy, and, and people are empowered. And so I'm blown away that they were successful at doing the opposite of opening it and saying, look how scary this is because it is not scary. I think, unfortunately, yeah. too, that um, people have heard about lithium battery ion fires, lithium ion battery fires, um, just from things like the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 and from, you know, stories about, you know, when you fly in a plane now, they ask you about your lithium ion batteries and, you know, whether they're checked in your bag and you can't have any loose, uh, as I discovered flying home from my fix it a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I just feel like I wonder if, there's just kind of a general stigma about them and people are aware of them as, you know, maybe Congress people too, about like what they are state legislators about what they are and, and how they're possible. It's they're capable of exploding. And then Apple's just kind of twisting the meaning and the narrative of like, you know, the difference between me, uh, a regular person taking a battery out and putting a new one in versus like everything we've heard about the danger of lithium ion uh, yeah. out there. 
I wonder if we should do some kind of demonstration where we took a bunch of different batteries and we punctured them. Like, let's let's trigger the fires and see. And show because you absolutely, if you puncture a battery, can cause it to catch on fire. But it would be, I think, really hard. I've got this wood table here to even set this wood table on fire using a lithium battery. Uh, yes, yeah, they have I, energy. I, yes, they can catch on fire. But like working, uh, the the fire risk of of operating a car is vastly higher than the fire risk of a of a cell phone. Probably, probably also the lead acid battery in your car is much more uh, is much more dangerous. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, every time I, I had to jump my car on Saturday, and every time I do it, it's like, okay, there will be sparks. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last that time you did something with your phone that, that caused sparks? So I think yeah, this and I also think it wasn't just the battery danger, right? I mean, I think that they were also telling people like, um, like you talk to a lot of technicians, we'll talk about long screw damage where it's like, you know, the iPhone has multiple screws in it. And if you put the wrong, if you just don't know what you're doing and you put the wrong screw in the screw hole, you can drill a hole through the components in the inside and break the phone. Like, right. Um, and this is true. So it would be nice if you had a map that showed you which screws go. It where. would be nice. It would be nice. It would also be nice if like high level legitimate repair technicians weren't being, weren't having their business model, uh, you know, being undermined by these tactics and because i mean it's it's we're gonna lose all the you know the technicians out there that are like actually really good at this and don't make right. mistakes like that because it's really hard to build a business when you know these these big companies are kind of undercutting you and the only people you're gonna have left are more or less the you know like the right. people who are less committed to that field I'm just astonished at how easy it is to sow doubt. I mean, if, if you thought it, we were going in there and saying, hey, you know, we need independent uh, tailors. We need people who can who can fix clothing and they're going to need to use sewing machines and they're going to be modifying, you know, the, the manufacturer, they're going to be modifying Patagonia or Levi jeans, right? And they're going to be using the sewing machine to modify the jeans and think about all the safety problems. If, uh, yeah, if they use the sewing machine wrong, they could, they could hurt themselves. And all of this is true, but society is built on these principles of personal responsibility. Uh, and, and so I just, I mean, I am continually yeah. astonished at how easy it is to sow doubt when, when you consider how commonplace and everyday these repairs are. I, I mean, you wonder, I also, maybe it, maybe it wasn't easy for Apple to accomplish this. Maybe, in fact, that it took some of the most brilliant marketer of, you know, creating this mystique that these devices are so complicated and brilliant and magical that people can't fix them, that they're different than a sewing machine or an automobile. Um, and, you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, may, maybe we should uh, marvel at the, you know, what they've accomplished <laughs> kind of convincing people that a small electronic device, which we know as a smartphone is m more magical than all the other devices right. that are, that are made. And, I mean, it's a pretty impressive device, but you know, if you've ever seen one taken I apart, one, it, you know that it's just me here. Here's your speaker. It's yeah, it's just it's like any other piece of now. electronics. But also, do you do you guys feel like that there's no particular fire under them? That like you know, it, legislators, if they have an option to do nothing, um, it's often a very uh, attractive position because if they do nothing, it's not like people are knocking down their door saying, "Hey, I broke my iPhone screen and I don't have a lot of options." You know, they, you know, people are aware of it. People know that perhaps that they're um, being forced to pay money for things that should be easier to get done and and should cost less. But like, you know, P, I guess people think of them as first world problems. They're like, oh, my iPhone screen needs replacing or whatever. But, you know, I know it's not. I just wonder if that there, there's no there's not enough. Uh, it's not felt an impetus to to act yet. And that's well, what I we're all working on, I suppose. I mean, I think you raised two things. One is that legislators will have a natural inclination towards the status quo. Um, you know, like the, the the default option will be the status quo, and I and that's just true, right? Um, it takes them a lot to you know to legislate something, and there's risk there. So, that, you know, they they tend to be a risk averse kind of kind of profession. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and, and, but that's true with everything that gets legislated. It, it's easier to do nothing to do something. Um, but then the other piece, which is, um, you know, like every issue has both the breadth and the depth of the support, right? And so 
and for a lot of issues where it's like everybody has a phone, everybody is harmed in some way by an inability to affordably maintain that phone. In your house, there's probably about, they're on average, there's 25 electronic devices. So this is an issue that touches every household and, um, you know, many, many times over. And it is, and, and so there's a lot of, you know, kind of, there's a super broad implication, but then we, we struggle then to then represent like the kind of depth and urgency of the problem. And I think that as for, for those of us who do have those stories where we're like, we have an urgent story about like, you know, how, how our life was interrupted in some meaningful way by the, by the inability to fix something. Like we need to make sure that we're getting those stories out because we do need, I, I feel like this campaign needs a little bit more of that urgency. And, and, you know, sometimes that happens when, you know, like during battery gate, we saw like a huge uptick right. in, in, you know, attention around and urgency around this issue, because like everybody was dealing with, um, you know, kind of very annoying uh, slow phone slowdowns. And it was, it, you know, the kind of outrage factor kind of peaked. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's, it's, it's hard to, yeah. Like, like, so how do we, how do we get people a lot more outrage? Right. Let's let's generate a little bit more. I mean, it, it, this has been a major issue. I saw uh, uh, motherboard stories on uh, you know, the tractor repair issue and some of these brother Apple fighting things. Those stories made it to the top of Reddit something like four times over the last week. Uh, so Reddit is outraged. We just need to get the rest of the country outraged. Uh, and and I'm I'm very open to ideas on this. One thing that I think is helping to get more of the country on board is we have so far had three presidential candidates come on board and support right to repair. Uh, we had Hickenlooper from uh, Colorado and Elizabeth Warren came on board. And the latest one is that Bernie Sanders has added at least ag right to repair to his political platform. Which is super cool. We now yeah. we, we just gotta get uh, we gotta get some of the Republican candidates on board. <laughs> Uh, I don't see any reason why uh, President Trump wouldn't be supportive of, of right to repair. If you think about uh, his kind of background as an asset manager, you know, dealing with with company, uh, you know, running buildings and all the HVAC and all the complicated equipment that I mean, you're you're building a big, complicated skyscraper. You're planning on a 50 or 100 year uh, support life. Of course, your maintenance people should be able to take care of that equipment. I mean, obviously, this has been a bipartisan thing all across the country. Pretty much every place we've worked on it, it's been part of you know Republican platforms. I think the Republican candidate for governor in Virginia had right to repair on uh, his platform last year in 2018. That was last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we can we can get there, but it would certainly be nice to get more Republicans running on this. Uh, we, uh, Kevin, you read a story about how how right to repair is really a free market issue. Yeah, um, there there have been arguments made by uh, such non-liberal bastions as Reason Magazine and, uh, you know, folks uh, across the spectrum about how, um, you know, just that right to repair is not an issue of trying to get in the middle of you and a contract you have with a company. It's, you know, which is a fear that some people have espoused that it'll uh, that, you know, allowing people the right to repair their stuff without fearing um certain kinds of, of tactics by companies will, will, you know, that'll make warranties invalid and it'll make warranties, these big clinging things that companies will never get out from under. But, um, most of the time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but most right to repair legislation has nothing to do with your warranty. Um, that's just a agreement you and the company have come to about like what you'll do within a certain time period, very limited, uh, under very, you know, laid out circumstances. Uh, really it's just about being able to have a choice to fix things without, uh, kind of, you know, a uh, market manipulation uh, tactics. So, right. yeah, uh, well, that's up on this is up on our blog if you want to search for it or, or find it on our on ifixit.org. Yeah, we, we can add the link to the show notes. Uh, sure. I mean, fundamentally, copyright is taking freedom away from society. What copyright is saying is that uh, if we are going to make it illegal for you to take a book that uh, I wrote and photocopy it and sell it. Right. That, that, and the copyright is actually in the U.S. Constitution. So that is we're fundamentally we're taking freedom away from individuals and saying you do not have the legal right to you know, mass copy other people's works. Uh, so that makes sense for protecting the creative works, protecting authors. Uh, but when when manufacturers start using it in, in ways that were, were not intended, uh, you start to have this creeping overreach of the intellectual property regime. 
And that's where I think things get really dangerous and, and where you, you, we should be looking at legislation, not to pass additional regulation, but to roll back some unintended consequences of these protections that we put in place for, for our creators. So, so I'm looking at the comments here and uh, we had uh, some folks talking about uh, boombox repair. And I, I, you know, I, I had to remember having a boombox ramp, but Kevin, you have a boombox or your friend had a boombox. What is this thing? Um, a friend of mine uh, had a, used the, um, uh, the jawbone big jam box. And if you and remember so the jawbone and it's like, yeah. it's, it's tiny. It's only about six inches long. What is well, this? Well, they thing? made a, they made a model called the big jam box. Uh, and it was, it's big. <laughs> it is, it is. If you threw it at someone, they would be injured heavily they, they would have to go to the hospital um <laughs> but jawbone you know they used to run the bluetooth speaker market and so this is going back quite a few years uh when he bought it but uh he it was dead and he loved it though because it was you know perfectly working fine you know the technology of playing music in your backyard has not <laughs> advanced that fully since you know the, the heyday of uh jawbone so he wanted to replace the battery in it and uh, using an ifixit guide uh me and my friend did it at a bar, no less. So we didn't even have a nice, <laughs> clean area to work with, just a tabletop. But uh, I, I saw your pictures on Instagram. I was really surprised at how big this thing is. Yes, I it mean, is very it's, big. It's interesting in market contrast because the, the original boom boxes, you know, they had the battery port on the back and you'd stick your C or D batteries in it. And and of course, the batteries were removable. And I think it, it's interesting that the Jambox decided to make the batteries non-replaceable. Yeah, and once you once you kind of break free of that mental trap of, you know, this thing is old, this thing seems to be malfunctioning in some way. Ergo, uh, it is my sit, it is my duty as a capitalist citizen to go buy a new one. Like once you kind of break free of that mold and you're like, actually the battery goes out, the battery goes in. <laughs> and now I am listening to Coldplay in my backyard again. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of wondrous once you like realize that like, I don't have to go buy a new thing. I can How just keep using this thing. guys to swap it. Um, I'd say about 30 minutes, but How it was many beers. Well, that was beer number two. Okay. So if it had been beer number zero, it might've taken less than 30 minutes, but yeah. you know, we, we had to talk about stuff too. And so we, we had a guide on, I fixed it. That I think it was a community created guide that you used. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where did you get the part? Uh, I believe he eBayed it. Um, somebody, some factory is making, you know, you just look up the model number, uh, yeah. the part number and, uh, someone is, is selling them. It, it works. Uh, I checked in with them last week, uh, earlier this week, and, uh, it is working, uh, quite well. So I went to a I went to the Belmont Fix It Clinic in Belmont, Massachusetts, and somebody brought in a big old boombox uh, from like the 1990s. Um, and uh, so, if you guys don't know what Fix It Clinic is, you can there are these free community events. It was held in the library. You bring your broken stuff, and somebody who knows how to fix things fixes it with you. And uh, Jonathan Crones, who, who was a volunteer at, at, for Fix-It Clinic, uh, replaced the drive on the tape player with a hair band wow. and, and got the boombox working again. So <laughs> that, was like the, that was like the coolest, most MacGyver fix I've ever seen anyone do in my life. That's and, great. Uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't know if you've ever been to one of these repair events, but they're like, it's such a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon helping your neighbors fix things. Especially when it ends with a boombox being fixed and like, you know, they break out the cardboard, people start break dancing. <laughs> I actually, I, I, I don't remember what tape was in there. Like, I want to believe for, for whatever reason that it was like the beginning of Les Mis. Um, <laughs> there you go. But cassette tapes are coming back. When I was, I was talking with the folks at uh, Homeboy Industries in LA and they're, you know, repairing all kinds of things. They do a lot of audio equipment and cassette tapes are all the rage right now, uh, particularly for hip hop. I think the sound reproduction is just a little bit better for hip hop with, with cassettes. And they, uh, the, the original, uh, the original, uh, you know, pocket, uh, was Sony, um, Hubble Walkman. Ford. Yeah. Yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah, the, the, they are crazy popular because of guardians of the galaxy. So if you have an original, uh, right. Sony, you want to make sure you keep it, keep, hang on to it and, and get it to someone that fixes it. Cause it's probably worth a chunk of change. And the headphones that worked on the Sony Walkman could now work on your phone, depending on the phone you have. Headphones. There, there you go. Assuming you still have, have your headphones. Speaking right. of headphones, we have a new Android phone in the building. I'm crazy excited about this. Uh, Google rolled out their new Pixel 3a. Kevin, tell us what's the deal with the Pixel 3a. 
Sure. Well, our teardown team has been uh, taking it apart, and I can see that they're still I arguing. I have one right here <laughs> in pieces. Um, they're still arguing some of the finer points and grabbing some photos and stuff. But uh, yeah, so Google's new kind of uh, mid-range uh, pixel uh, is uh, being torn apart. And, uh, you know, we're not going to give away too much. You can check out the teardown when it goes up on iFixit uh, pretty soon, we think. But, uh, you know, just taking it apart, it's pretty interesting to see what decisions Google's made uh, to get it down to about a $400 price point. Um, that's so what's really dramatic about this, right? Is it's it's basically a full blown Pixel Three. It's got the same camera, yeah, uh, at least the same primary camera as as the Pixel Three, but it's half the price. Yeah, my dad always told me not to negotiate against yourself, but Google is <laughs> weirdly trying to make the case that nobody should pay for their more expensive phones anymore. Um, the the camera is the same as the Pixel Three. Uh, the you know, the back is plastic, but I, I wonder how many people really care about a glass back or a metal back. back. Yeah, it's plastic, but it feels pretty nice. And, and oh. you know, it's got the same kind of dual color tone thing going on on the back that that they have with the other pixels. But the other pixels, it's glass on top and metal on the bottom and the glass up here breaks. So I kind of like the plastic. It, well, it, it's perfectly fine in your hand. And then also, you know, because that's going to be uh, not as uh, easy to break as glass or, or metal on the back. Um, the interesting, the two of the more interesting things to us is that uh, you can take the screen out first. <laughs> it's easier to replace the screen on this than with, mm, I think, any pixel they've torn down. Um, double check that when I get a chance. But like, and then also, it's uh, well, it's pretty modular, pretty easy to take apart. We didn't even have to heat up the uh, eye opener that we usually throw in the microwave and uh, toss onto the glass to loosen the glue. It, it's remarkably pretty. Pretty good. And here's the best part of the whole thing is this piece right here, which does not take up very much space inside the phone. What do you think I'm holding? The camera? This is the headphone jack. Oh, I see. <laughs> which is, I, 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 maybe I'm just, just personally a little bit obsessed, but I love my headphones. They're fantastic. They make my life better every single day. And, and, and you don't have to buy a lot, a series of small batteries to use them. A series of small batteries are they going to wear out? They got to deal with Bluetooth pairing issues, or you know, deal with the AirPods being this, you know, completely um, kind of garbage. I had, for I had the, the other day. I, I didn't have my even though I have an iPhone six, so it has a headphone jack. Um, I was on a flight and I only had Bluetooth headphones, and then so I couldn't watch the little TV. How sad <laughs> for you! You had to work instead. <laughs> I was. It, I'm not going to say the airline, but it was one of those airlines. Yeah. Uh, that does not have enough room for a, a human being of, of normal stature to fit a laptop between them. And oh, the no. So what did you do? You couldn't use your laptop. You couldn't watch the show. What else is there to do in the world? Um, I found some inner peace. <laughs> <laughs> Just meditate on the plane and stare at the stare at the seat. Well, you got that nice engine hum. There's really, you know, there's just people around you. It's a good, t yeah. it's a good chance to be in touch with yourself. You know, Nathan, before tablets, there were these paper tablets that would you kind of, they actually, they folded, which is something we're working on with tablets and, but there were text on them. Yeah. I hear good things. Yeah. I, sh you know, I should have come prepared. I was not prepared. <laughs> yeah. Worst, worst case, you have to read the in-flight magazine, which is a, its own special brand of catastrophe. The Sudoku was already done. So oh no. Someone. <laughs> Well, I think uh, you know Google's go clearly going you know down market in price, which is probably a good thing because uh, you know all the budget Android phones. There's a lot of good ones, but some of the challenges have been getting software updates. Uh, certainly, Google has, I mean, the best camera tune, right? The, it, Kevin, is the is the Pixel Three the best uh, cell phone camera on the market? Um, with some hedging, yes. And the Pixel Three A has the exact same camera uh, as the Pixel Three. Uh, you know, they looked at it, <laughs> our team looked at it and it is the exact same camera. And, you know, it's also bolstered by Google's, Ooh, um, it's bolstered by Google's own, um, you know, software that kind of helps with stuff like night sight and things like that, that, yeah. uh, during their presentation on Monday, Tuesday, uh, at Google IO, they, um, they showed a comparison shot, the exact same shot taken like a dark roller rink type scenario. And, um, they said they had a pixel, a pixel three, a shot and a phone X shot. I wonder what phone phone X is. I don't know. Just Are give there or any take other one letter that have X in the name. <laughs> so they, you know, so that, that that's 
that's their strong point is that they can power, uh, you know, some of the features of this phone with their gigantic <laughs> earth crushing amount of servers. But um, it's it's interesting. Like I said, it's interesting to see them basically come out and say like, oh, we understand you don't want to pay nine hundred dollars for a phone. So here's the four hundred dollar one. And I I don't know if most people notice the spec bump. I mean, the, Respect, the main, uh, run right, bump, the, whatever the opposite so the main of the difference bump is. is the other one has an additional camera. It's got a, a higher spec uh, Qualcomm processor. Uh, it's got the metal back. It's the uh, NFC charging. Those are kind of the main features that the left out on the cheaper one. Wireless charging. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, like, I don't really feel like wireless charging is at a point now where it's like a must have. Right. Well, and I would argue, you know, if you're thinking about it from an environmental perspective, you don't want to use uh, wireless charging because, you know, that, that heat is the charge pads heat up. All that is lost. Your phone, you're going to use something like four times as much electricity if you're charging your phone wirelessly than if you're plugging it in. Oh, so if you care about your electricity bill or the, you know, minimizing your carbon footprint. You always want to plug your phone in and not use wireless charging. I had never thought of that. We uh, we're working on the uh, the green cell phone standard as part of our right to repair advocacy. We get a we get a weigh in on these green standards for cell phones. And one of the things that I proposed was that we should just ban wireless charging on all phones purely on environmental grounds. Like if 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 everybody in the in the country switched to uh, wireless charging for their phones, you're talking like instantly four x the energy usage of of everybody. I mean, you plug into the wall and and the charging, uh, particularly Apple chargers are quite good. It's 90 or 95% efficient and, and you're nowhere, nowhere close to that with wireless charging. And not to mention all the, I mean, like everything in, in someone's house, when all of a sudden a new standard comes along and you just have to go buy a raft of gear, you know, you now you've got to, now I got to have a wireless charging pad for the kitchen. Now you got to have one for your bedroom. You know, now you're, you want to have all these things. My dog doesn't like it either. He doesn't like the sound of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just more stuff you got to buy and get rid of. Right. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, we'll see how this goes, but we, it's been, we've been a little bit frustrated over the last few years. If you look at our repairability rankings that the, the flagship phones have been getting worse, you know, we've downgraded Apple uh, a little bit as, as they've gotten a little bit more challenging to open. Uh, Samsung has been consistently rolling in at a four out of 10 on our scorecard. So it'd be really nice to see a phone that is higher. And I'm looking forward, I haven't seen the final score on this, but I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what our engineers assess of that. Well, it yeah, seems like a really great phone. I, I guess it depends on whether we, we, <laughs> sorry about that. My dog was being an utter jerk. Um, I guess it depends <laughs> on whether this is a, a one-off attempt to re recapture some of the low end market, or if it really is like a, a signal direction from Google. Well, I don't see why you can't have a spectrum of, of, of options. I mean, Apple said, Hey, we've got the XR and the XS and there's a big price difference between them. Why can't you have a, Sure, phone. with the bottom still being seven hundred dollars. Correct. Well, and so then Apple's bottom is the iPhone SE, which we've talked about in the past, and I still think is the greatest iPhone Apple's ever made. Uh, but its processor is getting a little bit long in the tooth. And it's it's coming up against the edge of iOS support now. I think. Well, they just need to bump the processor. I like, keep everything the same and just give us a better processor and maybe a new camera, and it'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm I'm sure uh, that that Phil Schiller is listening to me. <laughs> suggestions on on apple's uh market direction the, the other thing i think is, is is interesting i've had other people reach out to me and say well what is the you know if i if i don't have a thousand dollars to spend on on a phone what are my options so of course this is a good new 400 dollars option but what are the other kind of top android phone options right now um the nokia uh 7.1 uh the i think it's a 7.1 uh is an interesting one uh the moto g7 uh is an interesting kind of cheap mid flagship i don't like to use the word flagship like everyone else like a lot of tech sites do to refer to like because then a company will have multiple flagships and that really defeats yeah. the purpose of a flagship which is the one ship that's out the front one. of your navy it's a very confusing <laughs> structure of fleet to have multiple ships bearing your country's flag well maybe these companies have confusing navies I mean, <laughs> not that, everyone is running their military in a sound fashion Yes, that's true. Steve Jobs had a lot of uh, metaphors about the Navy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's you're you actually you don't lack for options if you're like I don't want to I don't want to take the cheapest phone my carrier is willing to give me for free, but I don't want to pay a thousand dollars for a uh, you know super high end device that you know looking at the, our teardown of the three A and co and comparing it to things like Samsungs and high end iPhones like the things that make them premium also just make them far more likely to be broken like a glass back you know, sure. a, a, a super fancy OLED display that is, uh, you know, 
uh, not front first, uh, as our team calls it, like that's harder to get to inside the device, wireless charging, another thing that can break, you know, it's just, it's funny that all the things that Google said to everybody like, Hey, do you think that this is, do you think we can do without these things? And I think people are going to say yes. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I mean, NFC, uh, man, what, what wireless charging, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's a, you know, not necessary. Even for the people that really like it, I think you could you could live without it. We've we've done without them, mm-hmm. those features in our phones for a long time. So I, I totally agree. I mean, and the, the glass kind of you know fit and finish polish is what a lot of people talk about, but like they all look the same, and you're going to put it in a case anyway. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I, it's interesting as you think about repairability of these things. The Nokia uh, is a I'm not very familiar with that phone, and we have the repairability analysis of it. So I don't know if you, if you buy the Nokia 7.1, how fixable it's going to be. But we do know on the Motorola phones, because they're the only cell phone manufacturer that is selling parts to consumers right now, that that's going to be a pretty solid option. Right. Of course, you can get those parts from iFixit. Uh, and we, we've, we've had a lot of fun putting those, putting those kits together. Um, so the, the other major thing, I mean, this has just been so much activity happening in the right to repair world. Uh, April 30th was the day that we had our, our hearing in Sacramento, but it was also the deadline for comments to the Federal Trade Commission as they're uh, on their big nixing the fix campaign. And so I think all of us have been involved in one way or another writing comments to the FTC. Nathan, what is the FTC looking for? I mean, I think, you know, if you want to go back uh, to get a little context, I think you could start with... Um, how they sent out warning letters last April to six companies uh, telling them that their void warranty of remove stickers that they were sticking on products were a violation of the you know warranty law, the Magnus and Moss Warranty Act, which is a federal law that governs warranty policy. Um, and I, you know, and, and if you look at the call for research, I think that they're looking for ways to show, um, you know, the impacts uh, for consumers if the marketplace uh, for repair is undermined by, you know, various tactics of the industry. So they wanted to know kind of what the industry was doing that would undermine repair, um, you know, what harm or what impact that has on, you know, consumers. Uh, And then they also kind of left left space for the manufacturers to kind of give their side of the story, like why they felt it was necessary to, um, you know, set up these barriers to repair. Right. Uh, and so we hope that that process will yield some, you know, some clarity on, you know, is it good that this is happening or and how bad is it? Um, you know, I think from, from our part, we submitted some research that we did that looked at the way companies routinely deny or claim, tell consumers that their warranties are no longer valid because of independent maintenance or of the product, which is uh, generally considered to be a violation of their consumer rights under the Magnus and Moss Warranty Act, just like those those stickers are a violation. Well, and it's a far uh, you know, ranging investigation. They're curious about just obstacles to repair in general. And one of the things that I don't think gets talked about enough is how we generally out there fixing iPhones when they break, iPhone screens when they break, but most people are not fixing Samsung screens when they break. And if you go to a local repair shop, they'll tell you that most of their business is iPhone and not Samsung. Kevin, you did a little bit of investigation into why that's the case. What what what's going on? Uh, well, it's it's a it's a not one straight answer, but uh, basically, uh, the, the shortest version I can give is that um, Samsung uh, is the predominant, maybe ninety five percent market share runner of OLED screens for uh, phones, and OLED screens are the kind used in iPhone X line, and then most of Samsung's S phones of recent uh, vintage. Um, so that's great. You get really rich black, you get um, vibrant colors. They're maybe more energy efficient if you have a black yep. user interface. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're great. You know, they're, they're interesting and, and they're uh, probably the way forward or uh, one thing that a lot of people are looking at, but they're very fickle. Uh, they're hard to repair, to refurbish, to re, you know, to rescue from damage. Um, the, the used market for them isn't very good because they also burn in over time. Um, something that, you know, TVs had a long a problem with in the early days of OLED TVs. And then also just um, a lot of market forces in that Samsung, like I said, controls the market for how many are out there, uh, how much they cost and how much profit they want to make from them. Any uh, screens that are made and available for the repair market are generally snapped up by carriers and by insurance programs um, because they're the ones who have customers, uh, 
that have paid out a lot over time. And so they have got very profitable customers who they want to keep happy uh, versus independent shops who then have to get what they get what they can <laughs> to, right. to, you know, fix up phones and stuff like that. So it's a it's a multitude of factors, but really it all points to just nobody it's it's in nobody's incentive, including Samsung's to make a bunch of them available. That may change. Um, in the industry news, which I've now subscribed to a number of OLED newsletters I never expected to subscribe to. <laughs> um, there, you know, uh, Japan, uh, I think it's called like OLED Japan is investing a, a lot of money into a new factory. Uh, there are three different companies in China that are creating their own. Um, Samsung's not gonna have the, the bulk of the mountain for this uh, for too much longer. There's gonna be competitors, there's gonna be uh, things like that. And, you know, it just shows in the fact that like Apple has to turn to Samsung uh, for their OLED screens, a company, Samsung, a company who Steve Jobs once declared thermonuclear war upon and has, you know, was this receiving end of a 10 year, like $15 billion lawsuit. So, uh, yeah, right. that's, Apple that's is the interesting Apple's part. dependent on Samsung. I mean, Samsung is fabbing their, their main processors as well. So this is a, this is a connected industry. It's, it's crazy, but yeah. So that's one thing where, you know, uh, unfortunately, the answer is not one thing or one one place you can push to fix the problem. It's a it's a it's a general uh, kind of need that we we all have to get more uh, OLEDs available for for fixing instead of just asking people to upgrade all the time. I feel like this is an inevitable part of technical progress where you get some new innovation. There's only one or two companies that have it. They sign contracts with the big manufacturers who integrate it in, in with their their product. It, it could be any technology, right? It could be the the face ID, you know, uh, projector, right? Uh, pick mm -hmm. your 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 technical innovation, because the manufacturers have a lock on it. There's no way for the aftermarket to to provide those parts, and that's what we're running into right now, where we have aftermarket options for LEDs. There is no aftermarket option for OLEDs because only one or two companies have figured it out. Sure. Uh, one one notable contrast, though, is that with LCDs, uh, the screen technology we'd all been using for about a decade before that. And you know, still pretty common in a lot of devices, TVs, and other things. Um, they could be refurbished generally. Like you could, you could restore them if, if someone traded one in because it had a dead pixel or two. They could be fixed. They could be um, extracted more easily from devices and, and harvested uh, by recyclers or by others to to resell them. And eventually, yeah, I mean, probably at first, LCDs were the exclusive of one or two companies, but uh, a kind of a, you know, a market of remakers and and right and OEM parts uh, and overruns and stuff like that flourished. But uh, right and now we're just like, time for the, the led aftermarket to get to the quality level that yeah. the, the OEMs were, but it's also a very finicky technology. It's like right in the name organic led and that material, that layer of material as Samsung found out with its galaxy fold, it does not take well to any bumps, water, dirt, dust, anything. Uh, and that I think that's going to be you know, the, the nature of this moving forward. So we're, we're going to be rooting for Japan Display as they improve their technology, rooting for LG as they're bringing some of their new uh, LED fabs online and hoping that some of this makes it out into the aftermarket. Because even Certainly. like with, with, with Al, 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 the Apple Watch, there's stories this week that Apple has run out of parts internally for Apple Watch Series 2 repairs. And so if you go in right now to get your Series 2 fixed, they just give you a Series 3 watch because they <laughs> don't have the parts. Well, that's nice, I guess. Yeah. I guess, uh, but I mean, the the right you know repair parts uh, supply chain is is you know uh, is, it's a challenge to get that sorted. That's that's a lot of what we do with iFixit is figuring out alternative sources for these things. And we do have Apple Watch parts uh, from time to time, but we don't have them regularly. It's one of the harder things for us to source. And there is no robot that is currently tasked with recycling Apple Watch Series Twos yet. Yeah, there's no there's no death bot for Apple Watches that I know of. Maybe maybe next time it's, it feels maybe possible. Um, that, that Daisy could unglue the Apple Watch, but it's it's tricky. Well, that's that's my rundown of the major news for the week. Oh, you know the other thing that that is uh, I thought really interesting is Vice ran this amazing kind of cultural exploration of the AirPods, uh, and this story yeah. has just taken the web by storm. I see it everywhere. You know, uh, several days later, it's still the top read story on Vice.com. What what do you think she struck a nerve with there? Yeah, I mean, so I, I I also had like 10 people send me that article. And uh, I, I mean, I think that there's something that's just fundamentally absurd about having 
disposable technology. Like, I mean, just the idea that you would make something that would be, you know, I mean, it's like we're, I don't know if you ever gotten, I was just thinking about this because we were talking about airplanes being stuck in airplanes and they give you those terrible headphones. It's like there's disposable electronics, but like the idea that you would get like these expensive earphones that would essentially just have a very limited lifespan uh, and then be guaranteed to end up in the waste stream is, you know, I, I think people are starting to realize that we're in a moment in society where like we really can't afford to be doing that. And, you know, we've kind of gone too far with how disposal we've made everything. Right. Um, and, you know, and then Apple, you know, I think part, part of it, you know, they, they tend to get a lot of these headlines when it's Apple stuff. Cause I think that they have such a, you know, they have such a, you know, tidy brand and the environment is such a big, you know, part of the story that they like to tell about themselves, but yet that they make disposable electronics. Right. And it, you know, I mean, there, there's no other way to describe the AirPod, but, but like, you know, this absurd disposable piece of electronics. And they, they could have made it another way, but they didn't. And yeah, and I, I do think that like, people are starting to question that. And, and I, you know, this is a lot of the energy we see, especially in the environment space about right to repair, like, you know, why this issue is getting so much more attention and interest across the country is because people are worried about our relationship with electronics. It's not, it cannot last. We cannot it's not healthy. Yeah. You know, make use and toss at this speed. The planet will not abide it. You know, we're going to run out of this stuff in the ground and, it doesn't make any sense. It's not. It's not good for anything but short-term profit. Right. We need to. We need to shift beyond this world of disposal. And yet, you know, the way that lithium technology and you want to make something this small and compact, it, it's extra work to make it, make it serviceable. And it certainly doesn't doesn't help the bottom line. What, what I find amazing about this is, so we we did our original AirPods teardown on December twentieth, two thousand sixteen, and we gave this product a zero out of ten. And I have been screaming from the rooftops ever since that the AirPods are an absolutely terrible product. Uh, and uh, we get people pay attention to us to some extent, but not a lot. It hasn't made it mainstream. I'm sure that her story this week has gotten far more attention than than our teardown a, a few years back. And th th there's this cultural thing where even though we're telling people this product is going to fail, like it's going to fail in 18 months, it's going to fail in two years. We're telling you now, do not buy this. It will fail. Uh, people still buy it. And then two years later, they're shocked. It stopped working. And <laughs> I guess, I mean, that's just, uh, that's the, the, I don't know. I don't know if that's the, the cross that we bear. The, uh, the vice article, uh, AirPods are a uh, tragedy. Um, Goes in, also goes into the social implications of wearing, you know, $170 devices uh, loose in your ears, uh, the size at a size that is very easy to lose. Um, you know, as noted with a, you know, definite sales uh, end of life, uh, you know, within 18 months or two years, and just the, the implications of everybody agreeing that yeah, this makes sense. Carrying around a, you know, device I can lose that is like, you know. <laughs> a day's worth of salary for some people that right. I'm just carrying around just because I, I can't stop listening to podcasts for like 10 minutes while I'm walking down the street. I don't like, I don't like the, the minor inconvenience of a wire that I can hide under my coat. We buy all of our staff headphones and we have our internal policy. Basically these are the headphones that we will spend our, you know, hard earned money that people have entrusted us with. And uh, yeah, AirPods are absolutely not allowed to be purchased with iFixit money, unless we're doing a teardown to inform the public. Uh, I'm not going to support financially a product like this. It's, it's just, it's not an ethical product. Well, there, there you go. This has been a vast you know, set of topics. We've talked about <laughs> everything from Oregon to California to what's going on in Minnesota this week. Uh, Google's got a really interesting new product. Stay tuned for our teardown coming out very soon on the new Pixel 3a, um, as well as the FTC comments. And we, we sent the FTC extensive comments uh, during their nixing the fix investigation, and we will be posting our comments uh, publicly soon to our news site. So stay tuned for that. Uh, coming up next, of course, we will hopefully we'll have a vote in Minnesota soon. And then there are a number of other states that are waiting in the wings as soon as we're as soon as we're through that. The FTC is going to have their hearing in July. Uh, but we're interested in hearing from you. What would you like to hear us talk about on Repair Radio? If you want us to keep doing more episodes, it would be fantastic if you would 
t- uh, open up your, your favorite podcast app and rate us. It's the only way other people are going to find it. And that motivates us to keep doing this and keep, keep talking, uh, to all of you and producing more episodes. It's a lot of work, but we really enjoy doing it. We just want to know that this is, this is what you're interested in. And we want to talk about what you're interested in. So, uh, leave us a comment, uh, rate us. You can also watch this live on YouTube if you want to see the video version of it. Uh, and we will be back in two weeks. Thanks everybody. Talk to you later. Hasta luego.